All right, our second installment here in art history. We're going to go over the classical era, the Byzantine era, as well as the medieval era. Now, with the classical era, that's basically the art of antiquity. So we're talking about Greek art, and then Roman art is going to take a lot of what they do from the ancient Greeks. So that will be our classical era. The second era, the Byzantine era, is going to be pretty short. It's basically just early Christian art. And then we have the medieval era, era with Romanesque and Gothic architecture. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit further in depth with, with these, but we're still really only going to hit the highlights here for the most part. All right, so if we start here with the ancient Greeks, they have a very influential culture. The Greek culture and thinking uh, really held a, a real deep-seated humanist belief system, and they really had a, an intense focus on human potential and achievement. Um, in, in this type of belief system, humankind is, is regarded as regarded as the highest creation of nature, uh, kind of the most ideal, beautiful, and, and, and perfect of the forms. And so we're going to see a lot of that. We're going to see the human body represented in its purest form, which is, is nudity. Uh, we're going to see a lot of those statues. And we're going to see a real insistence on proportion, balance, and harmony, those, those type of things that humans tend to respond to as well. And so, if we look at the, the different things maybe ancient Greek, Greece are known for, uh, for instance, uh, the development of democracy, uh, that's something the ancient Greeks are known for, um, philosophy with the ancient philosophers like Aristotle and, and Plato, um, even the physical training they're known for. Um, the, the Olympics, for instance, is something that can be traced back to the, the ancient uh, Greeks. And so that, with the Olympics, the motto is, is faster, higher, stronger, the idea of competition to see who the fastest is, to see who the strongest is, um, that you know, feeds into this idea of the, the individualism, the humanism, of seeing what the, the height that humanities can uh, achieve and, and, uh, and work towards, basically. And so we see that with the Olympics, with uh, democracy, it's the type of government where every individual's voice matters. Every, everybody has a say, the individual is, um, is exalted to a certain extent, maybe more so than other types of, of government. Um, and so with philosophy, it's an extension of the, of the development of the human person, but instead of the physical like we see with the Olympics, as well as their, their training for war, there's, there's plenty of, of true stories about the uh, ferocity and the desire of the ancient Greeks to, uh, to fight, um, that, you know, uh, human bravery was something that was well regarded as well. But in terms of philosophy, it's really the development of the human mind as opposed to the body. And even if we think of the Greek gods and goddesses, they're very human-like in a sense. Um, the difference between humans and gods are basically that gods are immortal. Um, but the Greek gods and goddesses, which we will see a lot of their sculptures, uh, have the title of gods and goddesses and a lot of their architecture that still stands is dedicated to that as well. Um, they, they have very humanistic traits to them that um, you see jealousy and envy and the gods are always kind of plotting on each other and on human beings. They're, uh, they have all the passions that humans have. They're always you know, sleeping with people they're not supposed to and um, you know, a whole, whole host of things we see with Greek mythology um, that, that really reflect this uh, insistence on humanism that we see so often. Okay, and so the first sculpture we're looking at here is called Koros. And uh, Koros is an example of the first stage of Greek art. We have three basic stages. The first one is the Archaic period, the next one is Classical period, and then the last one will be the Hellenistic period. With the Archaic period, um, the ancient Greeks are just kind of trying to find themselves in terms of their art. They're really assimilating Near Eastern and Egyptian influences. In the classical period, uh, you're going to see more balance, beauty, order, um, and the rational are going to be uh, emphasized. With the Hellenistic age or period, you're going to see um, a little bit more motion and um, idealism is going to take a, a turn for uh, maybe more uh, sensual or emotional pieces, as we'll see. So those are the basic 
basic stages there. So you can see this is a good example of the archaic period because uh, if you remember in the last one that we had, the last video that we had, um, I showed you the, the picture of the Egyptian king and queen. And I said to pay attention to the pose that the king was taking. And so you can see that that is precisely the pose that the ancient Greeks are using with this sculpture here. That the, we, the weight is evenly balanced between both legs, but that left foot is kind of heel to toe with the right foot there, the left foot being in front, and the hands are clenched uh, by the side of the sculptor, or sculpture, I should say, and uh, the arms are, are just hanging there right beside, uh, right beside the legs there. And so that stance, that pose is, is called basically what this, this sculpture is called, Koros, um, which uh, is, is spelt here again. It's spelt um, K-O-U-R-O-S, Koros, which is actually a Greek word that means uh, male youth, uh, and with Koros, a lot of times that's what's being, being shown as, as a male youth. Okay, so you can see, um, you know, there, like I said, with with uh, Greek art earlier, um, you're going to see humans uh, shown kind of in the in the purest form, as as we see here. This is also an example of of this this early period, the archaic period in Greek art, and this is called the Euphronius Crater. It's uh, quite a uh, very a very good example of their ceramics. Uh, what we have here is a piece of ceramics that would uh, have been an, an earthenware vessel and it's using a black slip um, for those dark values there and then the, the natural clay body is showing, showing through with that, that orange type of hue that we see there in the middle. And so uh, this is um, really one of the few examples of, of pottery that we have that, that really dates back to, to, to this period that's, that's pretty well intact as we see here. And you can see again the theme here is of bravery um, that was was so important to people at that time. Like we see here. All right, the next stage within Greek art is the classical stage, and this is really when Greek art starts to become Greek art here. Okay, this is called uh, the victorious youth, is what it's called, and it's an example of of this next stage and you can already see here how much more naturalistic Greek art is getting and that's a staple we'll see with Greek art is become it becomes very very naturalistic since the whole idea is you know the beauty of the human being the human form being this wonderful creation of nature then they're going to be as naturalistic and true to that form as possible so you can see the development you know from here you know, something that looks like a human uh, but you know if you look at special attention to the way his muscles and, and tendons are. It's not exactly how a human would, would probably look. Uh, but this one's getting there. It's getting closer with the, with the proportion. Definitely uh, pretty accurate as far as a, a natural human anatomy here. And the next development that we see is the, the one of the pose, how different the pose is as opposed to this one. But this one, like, like we said earlier, it's very straight up, pretty rigid, uh, fairly balanced. And, uh, you know, nobody really stands like this for any given period of time. That most of the time you stand, you have your weight on one hip, and you'll relax the other leg while you do that. And that's what we see here. Okay. Um, the name for that is, is contrapposto. Okay, that is C-O-N-T-R-A-P-P-A-S-T-O, -P -P contrapposto. Okay, and that, that really is a more natural way to make a sculpture because it's how uh, the figure normally normally stands and and it really creates kind of an S curve to balance out the sculpture uh, that if you notice if you drew a line where the hips are located it would create a, a diagonal line as opposed to a straight line and to uh, basically be able to counterweight that uh, the body is going to move in a slightly um, kind of serpentine manner. And um, if you look at the shoulders, they're usually going to go the opposite way that the hips are in terms of, of the diagonal 
that's the way that the body, body balances out its weight naturally. So that's what we see here with this, this type of sculpture. Okay, now if you notice there at the bottom, uh, with this example here, um, it's missing the bottom portion of its legs. Um, that's something that we see a lot with Greek art, that there's not a lot of examples of, of Greek art that are left intact because of all of the warring and turmoil in that area uh, throughout history. And so what we do a lot of times in art, art history is that we'll, we'll use a Roman copy of a Greek original. As we'll see later on, that the Romans um, are very, very fond of Greek culture. They, they hold it in real high esteem. And so they'll, they'll take a lot of what the ancient Greeks do and then they'll incorporate it into their own, their own art. And so we had an, have an example of that here with this example. This is, uh, this is the uh, Dorophoros of um, Polykletos. And you can see it's a, a marble statue, and so it's a, a basically a copy of a, a Greek original. Uh, one giveaway of that would be if we look between the arm and the leg there, uh, we can see that bar that um, the ancient Greeks would probably be horrified to have a bar there because that's not naturalistic. That's not the way things actually look. Uh, it would look very out of place and it would really stand out. And so I'm sure they would, they would not be fond of that at all. Not something you would see from a, a Greek statue. Uh, but the Romans were a little bit more practical type of people and so if something like that is going to help the statue stay together then they'll just, you know, they'll put that there and not be too stressed out about it. Uh, but this is a good example that we have uh, with the feet here that we didn't have in the previous ex previous example and how that contrapposto is working because we can see that that weight is is really predominantly on that right leg. And so that left leg can relax and so we have most of the weight on that right hip and so we have that diagonal line from the, the right to the left hip and on the statue's right leg to support that leg since it's 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 really uh, supporting most of the weight of the statue, we have some type of, of element there that is helping support and help helping keep that statue upright so it doesn't collapse on its own weight. Most of the time it'll be like a tree stump, something like that, uh, something pretty naturalistic there. Um, but again, you can see how much more naturalistic this sculpture is standing as opposed to, our cor as opposed to the koros uh, that we saw earlier in that, that pose versus this pose. Okay, so if we move on to the architecture of this classical period, we see this example. Um, this is called the Parthenon. And you can really see in this example um, how important balance and harmony and those types of ideals, proportion, uh, were important to the ancient Greeks. Uh, they really took, went to great lengths to, to make uh, this, this example of architecture look stable. And part of the, the, that we don't really readily see at the, fir at the first uh, look, but um, what they would notice with really large buildings is that uh, sometimes they would appear unbalanced if they were built really monumentally. And so an example of that is if we were to go to, say, a skyscraper, and we would go up close to a skyscraper and look up, it would look like it has more weight on the top than the bottom because of our perspective. And so to kind of counteract the perspective here, uh, they're building this on a slight arc. Um, and so if they're building the foundation on a slight arc, then everything else has to be built according to that as well. If we look at the posts, the posts are, are slightly tapered from, um, you know, from, from bottom to top there. And especially if you look at the outside posts, you can see that they're tilted in a little bit. And so that is, um, you know, different examples of, of how they're building things, you know, slightly crooked to make it look straight. And so that, that type of balance, um, that type of insistence on proportion uh, is something that the, the ancient Greeks are, are real adamant about. Okay, uh, this next, next example is, is something that uh, we'll have to remember here for our test, this image is a very famous sculpture uh, that, that does survive, uh, again, not completely intact here, but um, it is an example of, of this, this 
this latest error that we'll get to, but it's uh, called Venus de Milo, V-E-N-U-S, and then D-E, then Milo, M-I-L-O. And so if, if we look here, we see an example of, of the female nude, and it actually does take a while for the ancient Greeks to be comfortable with the female nude, that with the male nude, for, for whatever reason, they're very comfortable with the male nude from the get-go. Uh, but with the female nude, it, it's like a process you see in their sculpture, that women start off having clothes or some type of drapery. Eventually that drapery becomes more uh, sheen, thin-looking, and then eventually it starts to look like wet drapery, drapery to where you can really see the form of the body underneath. And then after that, they, they start to have uh, nude sculptures of the females here like like they like they do of of the males okay and so this one is um, a, a, a female copy uh, first century I think copy of of a, of a Greek sculpture um, so it's a, a Roman sculpture just like a, kind of the last example that we saw but this one here is, is fully intact so we can uh, we can look at this one here to see what uh, what a, a Greek sculpture would look like if it was uh, fully intact there. And so with the last stage here, with Hellenistic, uh, the Hellenistic period here, we start to see a little bit more everyday activities, more historical subjects, and even portraits become a little bit more common for this, this era. Uh, the main thing is really we see more expression. We see less of the restrained, reasoned, uh, type of measured form that we see from the classical period and we see things that, that have more of an exaggerated type of movement to it. And so you can see here, uh, you know, the, the sculpture, she looks here like she's she's moving her arms and so that's a good example of, of that type of movement that we see from from this, this era. Another really good example of that is, is this sculpture. This is called uh, the Lacoon Group or you might see it referred to as Lacoon and his sons. Uh, but Lacoon is spelled L-A-O-C-O, -O, with two little dots over that O, O-N, L-A-O-C-O-O-N. Okay, and so here we have the central figure of Lacoon, and then those are his sons uh, nearby him. And so you can see how it's more expressive, that it's showing a, a lot of motion here with um, with the, the subject is per portraying here. They're essentially uh, wrestling serpents off of them, off of themselves there. And if you notice, you'd notice a couple things. Number one, the idealism that we see. That even though he's a father here, um, apparently he's a father who uh, likes to compete in the cathlons in, in his off time. He uh, seems to keep himself in an incredible shape here for being a, a father of full-grown males. And so that type of idealism is something that we still see in this sculpture. Um, another thing of note here with the sculpture is that even though their sons physically are shown, uh, you know, being adults or close to adults here, uh, the size is an example of, again, hierarchic proportion, that example that we saw with um, ancient Egyptian art. How, in terms of society, how important you are, that's how big you are shown in terms of the sculpture. And so uh, that's what we see here. The, the, uh, the two sons are not as important as the father in Greek society, and so uh, they're not as large as, as he is. Okay, so these are good examples of, of Greek art here. The next era that we look at will be Roman art. And so, you know, the, the Roman Empire was, uh, you know, really one of the uh, most impressive forces really to, to meet the earth, especially uh, back in that time. They basically dominated the known world. They swallowed up all of Western Europe and Northern Africa, the Near East, and basically everything on the shores of the Mediterranean. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the Romans were, were a little bit less idealistic, more practical than the ancient Greeks, but they really did admire a lot of Greek culture, and they kind of exported that uh, through their empire. And they would uh, especially, um, especially like to copy and do different renditions of their art. And so a lot of the, the Roman art are um, examples of copies of the ancient Greeks. Um, one thing that we see different here with, with Roman art that we see more of 
as something like this. Okay, this is a basically a portrait head of an old man. And here we have an, an old man that looks like an old man. You can see the effects of gravity in his face, um, you know, the, the, the creases in his brow, uh, the wrinkles, those types of things. Uh, you know, you don't really see that in this example here. This guy still looks like he's in the, in the prime of his life here. Uh, whereas this guy, he looks, you know, a little bit more uh, weighted down. Um, as well as shows a little bit more kind of individualism as far as um, kind of warts and all type of, of, of showing someone how, how they would appear as opposed, to, um, as opposed to something a little bit more idealistic. Okay, so... One thing that we do see being uh, somewhat unique here with the, the ancient Romans is that they were incredible builders and the, the method that they used with almost all of their structures were, were uh, the, the rounded arch. And so this is an example of uh, the Colosseum, a very famous structure that is built using uh, that, that rounded arch technique. And um, and this was uh, actually called the Colosseum for kind of a kind of an odd reason here. Um, art historians, a lot of them, will call this the Flavian Amphitheater. Um, the reason it's actually called the Colosseum is there was a very large sculpture next to um, this particular um, you know, development here, and because it was you know next to this really large sketch, excuse me, sculpture called the Colossus. They ended up calling this the, the Colosseum. So for our purposes, we're, we'll just call it the Colosseum since uh, that's what, what most people call it. That's what it's, it's really known as around the world. And it was basically where they would host uh, different types of games for Roman citizens to enjoy from gladiatorial combats. They would have that. They'd even flood this thing out and have like ship battles in there. Uh, they had like little trap doors sometimes where like a gladiator might be fighting like a panther or something and all of a sudden like a rhino would jump out of nowhere um, very intricate kind of system uh, that if you go there now you can actually look down on the floor where you would have originally a flat floor you can see down into uh, this this intricate system of, uh, of rooms and chambers underneath the, the floor so it is kind of a, a cool place to visit because you can walk on the first level, the second level, and you can see down uh, into that, that whole chamber and the way that the, uh, the floor would have been built on top of that. You can see in the corner they, uh, they usually have that um, shown as well. And so um, this is an example of, of just the, the kind of the massive building that the, the, the Romans were able to do because of the extent of their empire and how powerful they were. Um, we see examples of, of things like this that, that still stand today all the way from the Roman Empire. And so that arch is something they do a lot of things with. Um, we see the, the barrel vault, we see the groin vault, we see a dome. The, the Romans were able to create a dome in the first century that uh, it takes uh, European builders quite some time, like over a thousand years before they really uh, achieve the same type of, of size dome that they, that they were creating at that time. And so another thing that helps them build is uh, kind of they reinvent uh, the technique of concrete. And so concrete has a pretty good strength to weight ratio. It's, it's light, but it's also strong, and it's pretty cheap to make. And so, uh, so they're able to build some really nice structures. Uh, uh, this, for instance, would have been built with uh, a few different, different types of, of stone, like limestone and, and, and different types of materials there. Um, but uh, you can see this is how it, it exists in, in, uh, in its state today. And so as uh, Rome moves along in their empire, the, the power of Rome starts to dissipate a little bit. And so that's when we move into our next era here, the, the Byzantine era, where we, we basically have early Christianity being uh, an important influence when the, the power of the Roman Empire dies down. There's really not much going on in terms of society as far as a powerful institution or something like that that can really uh, maintain things like taxes for roads and all of these construction projects that the Romans would do. Um, but one of the, one of the things that, that did kind of order society to a certain extent was the, the, the early church. And 
one thing that the early church does is they will take the basilica form, which would be like in a, a meeting hall or an assembly hall uh, in the ancient Roman times, and they would use that for their church structures. And so at this time, we see uh, the basilica is starting to uh, take the, the form for the larger structures that do become the, the areas of worship here for the early Christians. And so this is what a basilica would look like on the outside. And what basilicas are kind of known for is that if you see something on the outside, it, it looks kind of different on the outside maybe than in the inside. That the, in, the inside is, is pretty intricately decorated as opposed to the outside. Uh, the outside is, is kind of plain looking here. You can see they're using that barrel vault system, the arch. But on the inside, you have a lot of art on the inside. You can see the columns here made out of marble. You can see the arches decorated. You've got this line of pictures all throughout, over the arches, the windows that we see, the, uh, the you know the interesting ceiling that we see there as well. Um, you know, this would be a, a pretty basic example here of, of what a basilica would look would look like. So in this case, this is the uh, Basilica of Saint uh, Apollinaire uh, in Clos. That's uh, what this one is named. Um, again, that's the outside there. This is the inside here. And so uh, this really happens when, like I said, Rome's power starts to dissipate, and so they move the Roman Empire towards uh, Byzantium, which gets renamed Constantinople, and today it's known as Istanbul. And that becomes the, the center uh, for the, the Roman Empire for a while after Rome leave, basically loses his, its, its strength. Okay, another example of a basilica. This one's a little bit different because it's built in kind of a octagon fashion, uh, maybe as opposed to um, kind of a longer, uh, straighter structure that most of them look like, like this one here. Uh, but we'll, we'll look at this one because this is a really good example of, again, the outside versus the inside. The outside here, um, you probably wouldn't expect maybe looking from the outside to, to see that it looks like this on the inside. Uh, that really almost every square foot of this particular structure here is, is adorned and, and really, uh, really beautiful artwork. And so this is called uh, San Vitale. It's the name of this particular basilica here. And we're going to turn our attention to this basilica because what is housed inside this area. And so one of the mosaics in this structure here, we see this person. Okay, This person is Empress Theodora. And the reason we're looking at her is because of something that happens in the early church that's going to have uh, some important ramifications as far as artwork is concerned. It's something called the iconoclastic controversy. Okay, so on one side you have the iconoclasts, um, and those are, are people who are against images of idolatry, basically. And so what they would consider images of idolatry would be any type of image of the sacred. Okay, and so this is something that we see in, in other cultures as well. We see it a lot in Islamic art, for instance. If you, you find a mosque most of the time that uh, can be very beautifully decorated with a lot of curvilinear elegance or sometimes a lot of geometric patterns or really beautiful calligraphy, uh, but you won't see images uh, in the same way that you'll see in Christian art. Um, well, early on in the, in the Christian world here, um, they're having to decide here between having images of the sacred and not. So it's a controversy that really lasts um, a, a pretty long time. It was uh, uh, Leo III, the emperor, who originally had a decree that that forbid these types of images because it was thought that these uh, these things were worshipped as idols. Uh, but eventually, it was ironed out, and it was eventually this uh, person here, Empress Theodora, who uh, basically at a certain point allowed for images of the sacred. Because in Christianity, here we have. Um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so God chooses to take the form of a human being um, in, in that second um, person there. And so because God in this um, you know, belief system of Christianity believes or, or, or exists in a human form, then it, it's okay to render essentially um, uh, him as such. Okay, so an example... 
of, of what would be a typical icon, something that we see a lot uh, kind of coming from this tradition here, would be this religious icon here. This is Andre Rublev icon, and it's Andre Rublev's version of the Trinity. So this is actually a story, I think, from the Old Testament, if I'm not mistaken here, of, um, of Abraham, how he has three angels that visit him. And the representation that we're getting here is that these are uh, basically the, the three persons of, of God within Christianity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it's kind of interesting how the symbolism works in this particular icon. Because if you notice, all three of the individuals here, um, they have the same faces. They're basically supposed to be identical. And um, what references them as different parts of the Trinity is um, their clothes. Uh, the sun, as we see in most examples in art, Jesus is being represented with a red shirt and a blue cloak. And so the blue represents kind of the divine spirit, and the red represents earth, you know, corporality that he exists in. Okay, we see the Holy Spirit on the right because he's just got the blue shirt on, and then the, the, the gold that we see uh, with, the <clears throat> with this uh, drapery, toko-looking um, apparatus over him. And then, then on our left side here, uh, we have God the Father with the, with the blue shirt um, <clears throat> and, um, and kind of the, a little bit harder to tell as far as his, uh, his clothing is concerned. Unfortunately, this one, uh, uh, the color here hasn't lasted so well over the, over the time. I think it pro would probably have had like a lot of gold leaf and different things like that originally. Uh, but, uh, of course, we've, we've lost a lot of that, unfortunately. And one of the things that they see in the middle there is, uh, is a chalice. And um, I believe what was being served there was, uh, was like some kind of sacrifice that they would have used in the Old Testament. So it's kind of alluding to uh, what happens there in the New Testament. And so uh, all of those different you know, things are, are different types of symbolisms that we see. Another interesting thing about like, the symbolism is that they're each, they each have a staff in their hand. They're very kind of thin staffs. And they do give us kind of this directional force here of, of, of structure within the composition. But it would be interesting that they would each have staffs since... Uh, they have wings. You wouldn't think that someone would, would need a staff here with wings. And so uh, it's believed at least the interpretation is, is the, the journey, essentially, that they would, uh, would be on there. And that's what that is supposed to represent. And so this would be an example of a, of a typical icon here. Um, another one that we see an awful lot is a Madonna and Child. Anytime you, you hear a Madonna and Child, it's basically uh, the mother Mary of, of Jesus and, and Jesus of Nazareth, as we see here. And so in this type of art, if we notice here, it's very different than Greek art. With Greek art, they're very, very concerned about the, the corporal aspect of humanity, uh, about proportion, about you know, the, the physical part of it. Okay? Uh, if you notice here, not that concerned with it. The throne, first of all, doesn't really even make sense as far as spatially. It doesn't add up. That's not how a throne would actually exist in terms of proper perspective. Uh, the proportion, they're not spending a lot of time trying to get the proportion right, it seems, here either. Uh, you know, Mary's hands here would be too small. I mean, look, just look at the little baby Jesus. He doesn't look like any baby I've ever seen. He just looks like a, a shrunken little man in this case. Um, you know, same, same thing with this one. The proportions, um, you know, as far as the elbow to the, to the hand, to the shoulder, uh, it's, it's not precise. Um, you know, they're not particularly concerned with the humanistic aspect of it. It's really more along the lines of the representation. These are images that are used to inspire worship, not to be uh, worshipped as the things themselves. And so there we, we get into kind of uh, some of the point of iconography here uh, being of, of symbolic content. Okay, another type of artwork we would see at this time would be like uh, illustrated manuscripts like we see here um, that would be part of, of early Christian activity. And so you would see monks a lot of times spend a, an awful lot of time translating Bibles because this was before the printing press. And so if you wanted to make a copy, you'd, you'd have to do it by hand. And so this is basically the title of like a, a book of the gospel. And so uh, you can see how intricate and how detailed uh, this is, and actually, if you look really close in some areas, you can see, uh, you know, little, uh, little funny uh, 
picture sometimes of, of things you wouldn't expect to see, like for instance of the head of the apostle there in, in one of the letter forms towards the middle uh, lower right section. Uh, you can kind of see that one kind of popping out of nowhere. Um, but this is one example of, of something you would see, and, and they do actually have some kind of funny things in the margin sometimes of these texts that these monks would spend endless hours copying. Um, like in, in a couple of them, there's 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 one where in the in the margins the the monk writes uh, something to the effect of, of "Gosh, my hand hurts. I just want to go home," or uh, "Gosh, it's really cold." Um, so you'll you'll see sometimes uh, little things like that. But um, but this is an example again of, of someone taking special ca uh, care with the with the title page here. Okay, and so. As we move along here, we'll, we'll start to get to what we call the, the medieval period. That's, you know, after Rome falls. And so really by the year 500, Rome's strength is, 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 is not substantial. And so that that's basically starts that thousand-year period or so where we call that the Middle Ages in between the Roman Empire and the Renaissance. And so, uh, by far, really the most impressive artis artistic feats or architectural feats uh, around around this time. And so, uh, specifically in the architecture of Romanesque, and then that turns into Gothic architecture. Um, those are two things around this time that we uh, that we see. And so, this is an example of something that would be Romanesque. And so, it's called Romanesque because it's using the Roman art arch, but Rome doesn't ex like Rome as an empire doesn't exist anymore, and so it's called Romanesque because it's not a Roman arch. And so you can see the arch being repeated. This is at Pisa, so we see the le leaning tower back there over to the uh, the right section of the photo, and um, you know, a few other uh, buildings. I believe the baptistry of of, Flor of, um, of Pisa is here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you can see them all done with this this type of uh, repeating arch. Uh, that would be, again, similar to the, the Roman arch there. And so if we have an up-close view of some of the, the detail of these structures, because a lot of these take an awful long time to build, um, you can see how much detail is going into this little portal here and how the artwork is, is used to adorn the structure. And so it really does beautify the structure, but the other thing that it does is it, it basically um, allows... Um, the artist to tell the stories that the congregation would need to know. Um, and so we'll see that later on an example of, of, of Gothic architecture in a little bit different way. But this is, is how it's shown with, with sculpture. And so you can see just how many little individual sculptures you have around this entrance way here. Um, and, and again, the, the, the special attention really isn't paid to getting things anatomically correct. For instance, if we look at the the head honcho Jesus here in the middle, uh, we can see that uh, you know his, his hand's huge in comparison with his head there. Um, that, that it wouldn't be uh, you know proportionally um, uh, the type of standard you would expect to see from the ancient Greeks. Okay, and so what is uh, Romanesque kind of will develop into what we call the Gothic architectural style. And so here with the Gothic style, like we looked at with the media of art, we see the buttresses and the flying buttresses. Um, we can see these things are huge, um, especially in a time, like I said, you don't have uh, too much as far as uh, social structure, um, but you do you do have the church being an influence, and so we can see uh, that most time, like I said, most time these these uh, buildings at this time are only like a story and maybe a half or two stories tall, whereas these cathedrals are sometimes 200, 300 feet tall. And so, uh, you know, they're by far the, the most impressive uh, artistic innovations here at this time. So one thing that gives us the distinct look of this Gothic architecture is the, the little pointed arches that we see, the buttresses and the flying buttresses. But of course the, the thing with the buttresses and flying buttresses is they're taking some of the load off of that inside wall there. And so that wall is able to house all of those beautiful stained glass windows that we see being such an important part with this architecture. And so that's another thing that we see, not just the sculptures up close, but with Gothic architecture we see stories in the stained glass windows as well. 
So that's a very good way to transmit information to a public that at this time can't really read or write. Most people at this point are illiterate. Some of the very few people that you have actually being literate are actually members of the clergy at this, at this time. And so being able to transmit information that's important to know visually was um, one of the purposes of, of the art that is utilized here. So you can see here, here on the inside how much light can, can come into these really, really large structures, how vertically these things are built. And so Gothic architecture is really a good example of how um, you know, form follows function. We looked at that at architecture in, in architecture. And so the function of these things is essentially to worship God. Uh, now they were also used for other things. If you were to have like a play or something, it would be a good pl place to have a play since it can house uh, basically, you know, the whole village here. But if you think about it, um, every aspect of, of these structures um, kind of leads to that purpose here of, of, of worshiping God. Uh, first of all, the idea of God, of any concept of God, would be something that would be awesome, something, you know, infinitely greater than, than, than us. And so we see these structures that are, are huge, and so that would inspire all there at the beginning. Um, you know, here we can see the verticality with which these things are constructed. That, along with the actual points, give you this, this really directional impulse to look towards the heavens. That, along with the light that's flooding in, that light um, is, is, can be correlated here to, um, to basically the Spirit of God. Any, any type of, of, of idea of God usually involves enlightenment or seeing the light, you know, that, that type of reference towards, uh, towards uh, the, the Almighty Being there. And so we have the light flooding in that has that association as well. And we mentioned all of the things about the art, the, the sculptures as well as the stained glass windows of, of giving the stories that are important. Um, so all of these things are, are really emphasizing this, the spiritual realm as opposed to the physical realm. That they're not taking the same type of interest in, uh, in humanity in a sense and the physical corporal reality of humanity that the, that the Romans or the ancient Greeks would. That here it's all about this light ethereal looking uh, type of quality that really harkens towards the spirituality as opposed to the earthy and the material. Okay, and so uh, that's that's you know definitely important at this time, especially considering this is um, you know roughly the the age that we have uh, you know like large bubonic plague outbreaks, and so for instance uh, one year that we see uh, the bubonic plague outbreak, and I think it's like probably around uh, 1348 or so, I think that's the, the, the year that we have the, the biggest outbreak of the bubonic plague. Um, it's believed that Europe lost anywhere from like, uh, you know, 25% to 33% of its entire population. So that's like, you know, one out of every three people you know dying in a single calendar year. Um, you know, obviously the, the things that pass on from this world um, are going to be of more importance than uh, the, physical, the physical aspect that, that dies. Okay, and so we can see that here, again, reflected in this type of, of artwork. Alright, so that's going to do it here for this, uh, this section. And uh, in the next section we'll, we'll look towards the, uh, the Renaissance.